So tonight we're talking about 10 myths about homosexuality. Um, now, these myths are myths across the board. They are myths that uh, sometimes it's homosexual and gay activists believe these things. Sometimes your average person who sits on the fence doesn't know. These are some myths that apply to them. Some of these are myths that apply to Christians. Things that Christians think we understand about it, we don't have it right, and we really need to get it straightened out if we want to really be effective in ministering to this society. Um, so, yeah, 10 myths about homosexuality. And um trying to think, was there anything else? Yeah, there, we're, we're going to be... There's going to be some things tonight that may be a little bit challenging, especially the myths that maybe Christians tend to adhere to a little bit. But there's also going to be some technical information, and there's um, it's going to be a lot of very politically incorrect stuff here. So um, it, it, it things that are not necessarily easy to swallow, but we're just taking a real, trying to take an objective and biblical approach to these things. So um, as I go through, I'm going to ask you guys, try to remember it every myth, ask you, have you ever heard these? Have you heard anybody talk about these or present these myths in any way? Um, so let's just jump right into it. Myth number one is that same-sex marriage is the law, so Christians should support it. Who's heard this? Who's ever had people say, well, it's the law now, so shouldn't you support it if you're a Christian? No? Not a lot of us have heard this one, huh? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Well, you're right. It's only been a law for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> okay. The truth behind this one is that uh, Christians are called actually to refuse human laws that contradict God. Understand, we are told in Scripture a few times to respect governing authorities, to submit to them. However, when those authorities require us to do something that would contradict God, it's clear where our loyalty is supposed to lie. In uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 27, the apostles are taken before uh, the Jewish ruling council. It says, uh, they, uh, and when they have brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intended to bring this man's and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. That's really the Christian perspective. Any time in which any sort of authority, be it government, be it um, a family authority, even be it like a church authority. The church is an authoritative institution. When that contradicts God, we are called to stand on God's side in every situation. Um, give an example. In the second century, I believe it was in the second century, uh, laws were passed that essentially told Christians that um, they had to sacrifice to the emperor. The popular thing at that time was emperor worship. And it was very easy to do. And actually, no, this may have even been the first century. I can't remember exactly. But um, very easy thing to do. All Christians had to do was walk into a temple. They took a pinch, literally, just between two fingers, just a pinch of incense, threw it on the altar, and they were supposed to say, Caesar is Lord. But that contradicted the Christian conscience. That contradicted the Christian doctrine that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're not supposed to worship any man's God. And so the Christians faced horrific persecution as a result of it. They would go through anything rather than contradict God. Now, that kind of example doesn't always appeal to someone. You ever, if you hear someone say this, well, it's the law, so Christians, you should support it. That kind of, um, that, that kind of example doesn't necessarily spark anything with some people. So let me just tell you, uh, if someone ever asks you that, be blunt with them about our history. Before the Civil War, the Supreme Court, on a number of occasions, upheld aspects of slavery. So just say, so do you think that good people should have just said, well, guess I better stop fighting it because it's the law? Absolutely not. There's a standard of morality above what the government says. Okay. Myth number two. Homosexuals can't help their feelings, so Christians shouldn't condemn it. You ever hear this or anything along these lines? Well, they can't help it, so why do you why do you criticize them? Why do you critique them so much on this? Why do you tell them they shouldn't do it? They can't help how they feel. All right, and this is where we have to draw a distinction. I, took, I touched, touched on this in the sermon a little bit this morning. The truth is, homosexuality is not wrong because of feelings, but because of action. All right, I'm going to ask a very challenging question. No, I don't want to, I do not want to offend any of the men in here, so I'm not going to single one out, okay? 
I don't want to get you guys in trouble with your wives. Okay, I'll just ask a general question. Men, how many of you have ever at any point in your life found a woman attractive other than your wife? Cowards, every one of you. (laughs) Women, (laughs) women, be honest. How many of you have found another man attractive? Even if you've never done anything or thought anything about it, you just thought he's an attractive looking guy, other than your husband. All right. Women. John Wayne? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, women are a lot braver than the men here, I think. (laughs) In reality, everybody finds people other than their spouse at times attractive, except for me, I don't, but everybody else finds someone other than your spouse attractive at some point. Now, does that make you a polygamist? Absolutely not. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with finding that. What comes in play is when it takes over your thoughts or takes over your actions. That's when it becomes wrong. So here's the issue. People commonly, when people try to say this, you know, they can't help their feelings, so you shouldn't condemn them. Really, people will tend to play with definitions with this a little bit and kind of try to trap you. Because the fact is, there's really, popularly, there's two meanings of the word homosexual. Okay? The first meaning is a person who has feelings of attraction for members of the same sex. That's not wrong. All right, The feelings are not good. You don't want to indulge those, but simply having those feelings is no different than me finding another woman attractive as long as I don't act on it. The other thing is, other definition is a person who actually engages in homosexual practices. Okay? Uh, and a lot of times people will kind of use this like a shell game. They'll say, well, so you think homosexuals can help who they're attracted to? Well, no, I can't help. And yet you're condemning them for something they can't help. What a terrible person. When all the time they actually mean by defending homosexuality, they're talking about people who engage in the acts. It's sort of a change of definitions and sort of a shell game that a lot of people use. But understand, this first definition, feelings of attraction, that is not wrong because that is temptation. A person is no more wrong for being tempted with homosexuality than I'm wrong for being tempted with stealing something if I don't actually steal it. Okay. Um, the fact is, it's the action that's immoral, not the tendency. Everyone, everyone is tempted at some point in some way. Even Jesus was tempted. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted, but Jesus was not wrong for it. So when we talk about... You know, homosexuals not being able to help their feelings. A lot of times they can't. I agree with that. But it's um, it, it's not just the feelings that are wrong. It's the action that indulges it. Let me uh, share you guys share with you guys a couple stories. Two guys I went to college with. Uh, one of them was a guy I didn't really know very well. Not a really close friend. But um, I went to our hall devotion every week. Halls we get together, all the guys and do devotions. We went for hall devotions one week, and we went into this isolated room where all the RAs met with the head, with the you know, the resident manager ever so often. And we all went in there and sat down in this private, isolated room with these couches, our whole hall. And my RAs, one of my RAs, stood up and said, "Guys, one of our hallmates wants to talk to you about something." And a guy stood up and he began to tell us that for years he had struggled with homosexual tendencies that it was a strong temptation with him. But here's the thing. When he told us about that, he said, I know this is not the way it should be. I know it's not right. I know I shouldn't give in to it. So I want you guys to please pray with me and help me to find the strength in God to resist this temptation. Now, on the other hand, another guy I went to college with had struggled with these kind of tendencies for a long time. Uh, never told anybody about it. But he was right there in a Christian environment, so it was much easier to keep your worldview and your thinking correct in that environment. Um, that, you know, everything, every single class he was in, every all of his peers, everybody he was around was very, um, it was all Christian environment, encouraging environment. And yet when this friend got out of college, I'm kind of speculating a little, I think he sort of let it slip. He got away from that strong environment and influence. And he let his temptations get the best of him, and he exchanged his faith in Christ for a homosexual lifestyle. He walked away from his faith as a result of that. Um, 
Now, between those two guys, were they both wrong? I think only one of them was wrong. Was that first guy wrong? No, in fact, I think he was even getting counseling. Everything he did, he did everything right. So if you're going to call that guy a homosexual, a homosexual I'm not going to say that homosexuality is wrong. I'm not going to say a person can't be a Christian and be a homosexual. But if you're going to use the accurate definition, the definition that a homosexual is someone who engages in certain acts, in that case, yeah, that's where we draw the line. That's where we say it's wrong. So we can't condemn somebody. It's it's correct. We can't condemn somebody for having a temptation, but it's the action that we say is wrong. Okay? Any questions so far or anything? If any of you guys have questions, just feel free to ask up. I'm, I'm actually recording this. I'm going to upload it to YouTube. Um, it'll be on our church Facebook page if you want to access it later. But um, I used to, when I recorded, I would wear like a headset with a mic and everything. But I stopped doing that because I think that kind of scared you guys away from talking and asking questions a little bit. So I'm trying to avoid that. But if you guys have any questions, just ask them. Okay. Okay. Myth number three. The Supreme Court. You guys know what SCOTUS stands for, right? Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court can decide what constitutes a marriage. You heard this one before? Quite a few of us heard this. In fact, just about everybody who heard the ruling two weeks ago heard this. Okay, the truth is, marriage does not belong to the government. It belongs to God. Genesis 2.22, I talked about this in the sermon this morning, but I want to touch on it again. It says, the rib that God had taken from the man, uh, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You know, this very first account of the marriage relationship, of human sexuality and the marriage relationship, was given as a gift by God to mankind. You know, governments do have free reign within the set parameters and limits that God has laid out for them. Okay? Redefining God's created order is not within what they are able to do. If a bill were introduced to Congress that said that the sky is green, and both houses passed that bill unanimously, and it was signed into law by the president, and it was challenged at the Supreme Court and upheld, and it had enormous, overwhelming support from the U.S. citizens. What color would the sky be? Blue. (laughs) You can call it green all you want to. Call it green till you're green in the face if you want, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna change color. There are some things that the government simply cannot legislate. And the government can't legislate that marriage, can't can't legislate what marriage is any more than I can legislate what you're gonna have for dinner tonight when you go home. Okay? It's not mine to say. It's not my authority. So, now that, that's one reason why I, I try to avoid even using the term marriage when you talk about this now relationship that's now legal all the way across the U.S. Um, in fact, I have a preacher friend who asked me a question, uh, messaged me, lives in another state, but uh, he was messaging me and just kind of hypothetical questions asking me. He said, um, let's say you have a same-sex couple that goes to your church. Um, now, believe it or not, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We want them here. We want them to learn about Jesus. Okay. But he said, suppose you have that, and they come to the realization, they're, they're married, but they come to the realization that their lifestyle is wrong. And they come to you for advice. They want to know if they should get divorced, because on the one hand, their relationship is not right, but on the other hand, um, on the other hand, they know that the Bible says God hates divorce. What do you tell them to do? No, what I told them, I said, I would tell them go ahead and divorce because what they have is a marriage only in the eyes of the government. I don't think it's a marriage in the eyes of God. So I would just tell them go ahead and get divorced because you're not breaking anything sacred there. You're breaking a governmental contract that you're breaking by your own free will you're allowed to break. So considering that, you know, marriage doesn't belong to the government. It belongs to God. Questions so far? Myth number four, this is the big one, and this is the one um, a lot of people have heard. This is the one that's going to take a while to talk about. Homosexuality is genetic, and therefore, okay, you ever heard that, that it's genetic? So you can't help who you're attracted to because it's genetic, right? 
Okay. This idea became widely popular back in like 1993. I think the journal called Science, that's the name of the journal was Science, published an article where they had thought that they had found like that homosexuality could possibly be genetic, but it was really bad science, really bad connections um, in there. The truth is, it's not genetic, even if it were that doesn't mean it's okay. So there's two sides to that. First off, it's not genetic. Second, doesn't matter anyway. Let's talk about that first. Is it genetic? Uh, let me read to you from an article from Orthodox Today. This is about several scientific studies that have been done on it. The article reads this, and I think it might be actually, yeah, it's on there. Eight major studies of identical twins in Australia, the U.S., and Scandinavia during the last two decades all arrive at the same conclusion. Gays were not born that way. At best, genetics is a minor factor, says Dr. Neil Whitehead, Ph.D. If an identical twin has same-sex attraction, the chances the co-twin has it are only about 11% for men and 14% for women because identical twins are always genetically identical. Homosexuality cannot be genetically dictated. No one is, no one is born gay, he notes. The predominant thing that creates homosexuality in one identical twin and not in the other have to be post-birth factors. Now understand, identical twins have exactly the same DNA, don't they? Perfectly the same. Therefore, if one of a pair of identical twins is a homosexual, if homosexuality is genetic, you'd assume the other one's that way too. Not so. Only about 11 and 14% for men and women, respectively, is the crossover rate. It should be 100%, but it's only 11 and 14%. That is strong indication that it is not, um, that it's not genetic. In fact, well, uh, that leads us then to the question, what causes it? I mean, why some people clearly have a strong feeling of attraction, strong drive in them towards people of the same gender. What causes that then? All indications that we have actually point towards a psychological factor. It's psychology more likely than anything else. And there's a number of things that happen in a person's life that affect uh, whether or not they have that psychological drive. So it's something that happens after birth. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that happen are the result of sin. Uh, in fact, there are five main factors for men. We're going to talk about men first, and then we'll talk about women in a minute. There are five main factors for men that push them to a homosexual uh, mentality. Okay? And pretty much all five of these factors need to be present. All right? This is what a number of psychological studies have shown. First off, for a person to be homosexual, they need to have a certain personality type. Uh, you know how the sort of the stereotype about homosexual men is that they're very artsy. They're like interior designers and things, and they walk in and say, "Oh, I love the paint color in this room." You know that? That's a certain, yeah. That's a that's a certain personality trait. It's an artistic trait that's more aware of that. And it seems that with men, it's only the men that are uh, have that art, certain artistic personality trait uh, or traits are uh, become homosexuals. Um, the second. The second um, aspect is they need to have an absent father. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily physically absent. Um, it just means uh, they can be just emotionally absent. Uh, and usually this is in pretty early childhood. You see, when a child is about two or when a young boy is about two or three years old, he begins to sort of detach from his mother and form a bond with his father. And that bond is very important because there's a psychological need there for a father figure. But at the same time, um, there is, uh, it, it also sort of teaches a young boy what masculinity is about, teaches him how to be a man, essentially. And uh, when the father is not present, or when he is present, he's just emotionally absent, uh, that causes uh, some very serious emotional and psychological problems uh, with young boys. So, I mean, the father can even be in the picture, but if he's just very harsh, doesn't really develop a bond with the children, he favors the other children and isn't good to one or the other, that can really be um, a major factor that plays a role. Okay, so certain personality types, the father needs to be absent. There needs to be a controlling mother. Okay, 
And now a controlling mother is not always a woman who stands up and just beats her husband into submissions as you do it. I said, she can be just spoiling to the child. She can just be doting on him just constantly, just giving him everything. Once spend every day decorating, you know, pink cupcakes. It can be anything that's just, it, it enforces, I, if I understand this correctly, it enforces a sense of feminist, uh, a, a feminine mentality, a feminine identity onto the boy. Um, Number four, there needs to be some sort of societal reinforcement. In other words, people need to be told by society. This can be positive or negative. A boy needs to be told by society either that he is gay, he be called, you know, he can be teased and called names in school, um, to that effect, or it can be a positive reinforcement, positive in the sense of people approve of it. They tell him, well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay if you want to be gay. There's no problem there. But there's some sort of societal reinforcement. And um, understand kind of what's going on. If I understand, well, I'll get that in a second. But the last one is kind of the more serious one. It's the sadder one. But um, the last trait that needs to be there is there needs to be some sort of a sexual encounter with a man. Um, this is the one that is, uh, this is the sad, this one is kind of the clinch. This is the thing that really draws the whole psychological cyclone together into one strong force. Um, now, it is suspected, if you actually poll homosexuals and homosexual men and ask them how many of them were sexually abused as children, you will get, uh, you will not get 100% level. You'll get like 60, 70%, something like that will admit to it. But it is strongly suspected by psychologists that 100% of homosexuals have had some sort of a sexual encounter, usually sexual abuse by a man, um, usually in early life before 14, before like 14, 15, 16. Sometimes it can be as late as college, but usually it's pretty early on, uh, in life. And if I understand how this works together, I, I'm not an expert here. I did consult an expert on it. I spoke with an expert. I know, um, what happens is when a boy's father is missing, his mother is pressing a feminine identity onto him. He has a need and a drive, a desire for a man, to know a man, to have a father figure, to be connected, to have a strong relationship with a man, then he's he's reinforced by society that he's homosexual, told that in some way, and then when a sexual encounter happens with that young boy, it takes all those feelings and desires, those needs for a father figure, and it confuses them in a sexual sense, and he confuses basically that need with a sexual attraction to other men. And that's where it comes apart for men. Now, this is part of the reason I didn't want to share it in a church today is the story is a little more, I don't want to say graphic, but a little more intense in the discussion we're talking about. I'll tell you a story about a, a true person, a person I've actually met before. I don't know him well, but I've met him a time or two, a homosexual man. And just tell you his life story. When he was three or when he was very young, his father left his family. So he had the absent father syndrome. He grew up and developed that artistic personality that's necessary. When he was about three years old, his father came back into the picture and tried to stay, tried to be a part of, uh, of that family. His mother, being the dominant one, said, no, get out of here. You won't have anything to do with our kids. And the father let her be dominant. He backed away and he left his two boys, one of them, this man we're talking about, left his two boys crying in the front yard for him um, at about three years old. Anyway, he... Um, Went through life, he was really feminized. There were no men in his family. He was only taught what it was like for it to be a woman. He was raised by women. He was just doted on and spoiled to death by women all the time. Um, when he was seven years old, he and his brother were both molested by their babysitter's brother. Uh, so two boys, both the boys were molested of that. Later on at age 12, his mother had remarried, and the man she married was perverted, and he sexually molested this one boy, the boy that grew up to be a homosexual. Uh, the brother was not molested at this point, but only the boy uh, we're talking about. Now, interesting, his, his stepfather at the same time was also sexually abusing four or five, I forget, four or five other boys the exact same age. Every single one of those boys grew up to be a homosexual. Every one of them. Uh, the boy grew up and he chose a homosexual lifestyle. Now, I told you he had a brother who had a lot of the other factors, had the mother that doted on him, had the absent father. He didn't have the personality, but he did have the sexual abuse in his life. 
And he grew up not to be a homosexual. Two brothers. And those brothers were actually identical twins. Exactly the same DNA. But slightly different factors changed everything in what they chose for their lives. Now that's for men. That is what psychologically works for men to choose homosexuality. For women, it's an entirely different set of factors. For women, it's primarily... um, The common thread seems to be also abuse by men, usually sexual abuse. And women seem to turn to homosexuality as sort of like a safer thing. They feel safer with women than with men because they've been hurt by men so bad in the past. So women turn to homosexuality because it feels safer. Men turn to it because there's a driving force and a need in their life. Um, Also, women who are homosexuals tend to change. They become heterosexual again much easier than men do. Uh, so clearly it is not genetic, it's psychological. Granted, it is the result of horrible, horrible, horrible um, effects in a person's life, but it is, it is psychological though. Okay, now we said it's not genetic, but even if it were, it wouldn't matter. Uh, even if it were a genetic force that were driving a person, you know, that doesn't necessarily excuse the behavior. Say, you know, hypothetically... I had a genetic, I don't know if it's genetic or not, but say I had a genetic tendency towards a bad temper. You know, all in my family were Scottish or something. I don't know. My whole family had short tempers, and we were just, I mean, we just blow up at anything. And every time any little thing sets me off, I jump up and I scream and cuss and throw stuff around and shove people out of my way, throw an enormous fit. What are you going to say to that? Oh, poor thing. You know, he just, It's just genetic. He can't help it. It's a part of who he is. You're not going to say that. You're going to say, I don't care what's causing it. You're wrong. Get some help. You know, attend some anger management classes or something, but get some help for it. Right? An action is right or wrong regardless of why the action is there in the first place. Okay? So it's not genetic, and it really doesn't matter if it is. Any questions or comments so far? In the sense that a, yeah, in the sense that a personality type can be genetic possibly, which I, I'm not even sure 100% of personality is always genetic, but, um, yeah, some people can be born more so with a possibility for homosexuality than that, but it doesn't mean that they are homosexual in the same sense that, uh, you know, I can be born eight feet tall, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be an NBA player. You know, you can be born with a greater possibility for it, but not guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even with these factors, um, they're not all, well, someone can have these factors and not be a homosexual. You know, a person could have all of those except have the wrong personality type and they won't be a homosexual. Never. Um, they can have all of these except for the sexual encounter and they won't be. It's, it really is a combination of like a perfect swarm of factors that affect them psychologically. It seems, uh, to the best of our understanding. Any other questions? Okay. Myth number five. This is a Christian myth. This is a myth a lot of Christians hold that we should not hold. Homosexuals are just bad people who can easily change, but they won't. The truth behind this one is homosexuality, while it is wrong, it is heavily, as we just saw, it is heavily influenced by strong psychological factors, okay? Um, as we've seen, homosexuals very much so are victims of horrible, horrible circumstances in their lives. Now, that doesn't mean they're right to do what they do, but it does help us understand um, where they're, what their mentality is. They have psychological issues. Um, now, that does not excuse the behavior, but it does mean it's very controlling for them. Uh, ultimately, and this is where we get about as, this is about as politically incorrect as we get. Homosexuality is probably best classified as a mental disorder. It is a mental problem. And people who have mental problems will tell you it's not as easy as just, Hey, stop that. So, um, there, there actually is therapy for homosexuality. They have successfully developed therapies that will help people get through it. The problem is uh, that therapy, you don't hear a lot about it because it's strongly condemned by gay activists. They want you to think, well, there's nothing wrong. You don't need to fix them. Um, but my point with this one is while it is wrong, it's a little more difficult than just saying, well, why don't you stop that and marry a woman? There's a little more to that. There's a little more of a challenge involved. Okay. 
Myth number six. The Bible's commands about homosexuality are cultural. Who's heard this before? Anybody? Just apply to that. You know what I mean by cultural commands? Yep. Pretty much anyone who claims to be a Christian and approve of the lifestyle, um, this is what they're going to say. Well, it's just cultural. It applied back then, but it doesn't apply now. Almost always. Yeah. You ever never heard this before? Like, yeah, the Bible says things. The Bible says women shouldn't have braided hair, but yet women braid their hair all the time now. Isn't that a horrible, terrible thing? The Bible says not to do it. Well, that's a cultural command that applied to that particular culture. So people say that that homosexuality only applied to a particular culture. All right, the truth is, the Bible speaks of homosexuality as an objective, immoral action, not as a cultural taboo. All right, people say, well, first off, homosexuality is only in the Old Testament, and so it's just one of those Old Testament laws that you don't have to follow in the New Testament times. Uh, The truth is, homosexuality is condemned in the New Testament as well, and we should look at the Old Old Testament command in its proper context. In Leviticus 18.22, we read this one this morning in church, it says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Now, you take that by itself, maybe you could justify saying, well, it's, uh, it's just something that applied in that time. But you can't take that verse just by itself. Their surrounding verses are quite intense. The verse right before that tells you not to sacrifice your children to pagan gods. The verse immediately after tells you not to take part in bestiality. So if you're going to say, this is cultural, why not say those other two are cultural as well? And it's okay to do those things now. Uh, There are two types of context, basically, for laws in the Old Testament. The first kind is, don't do this because you're supposed to be a different people set apart from everyone else. Those are things like, you know, don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish, because you're going to be different. Not because there's something inherently evil about pork, but because there needs to be a distinction, one of the reasons, there needs to be a distinction between God's people and the people around them. The other one, the other context is, don't do this because it's absolutely immoral. Now, in Leviticus 18.22, right after this, it says, Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all of these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity." In other words, God says, don't do these things not because, well, it's you're going to be different for me. Don't do these things because even the pagan nations, before you did those things, and it was evil for them and it's evil for you, it's a constantly running thing. Um, now, there's another claim. People will say that the New Testament commands about homosexuality only apply to, well, they only apply to open homosexual relationships. You know what I mean by that? It means basically have sex with anyone you want to, not just one specific person. They say as long as it's one person in a committed marriage, then it's okay. Romans 1, verse 26, let's read this, says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay, the fact is, pagan Rome was one of the most homosexual cultures ever to exist. It has been said that 14 of the first 15 Roman emperors were homosexuals. So, why then, if it's, if it's so acceptable in the society in which the Bible was written, why would they say don't do it? Why wouldn't they say, well, don't do it openly? Don't uh, have many partners, just have one. Why would homosexual homosexuality only be forbidden in open relationships? Why wouldn't they just say, hey, only in marriage can any sexual relations take place, so it can be men or women? They, wouldn't, they don't make that distinction. They don't say, well, as long as it's between a committed partner, it's just this one thing. They don't say even, hey, don't, don't have sex outside of marriage. Men and women don't have sex outside of marriage. They say um, just homosexuality. They say don't do it at all. Um, It's condemned as unnatural and not only as inappropriate. I don't think there's really any good reason to believe it is simply a cultural command, something that was just taking place in that time. Okay, questions or comments so far? All right. Myth number seven. We're through the longest of them now. We're on the downhill slide at this point. You'll hear this a lot of times. Homosexuality is no worse than any other sin, and therefore Christians shouldn't be more opposed to it than they are to things like gluttony. 
Let me tell you, this is where I'm going to have some people disagree with me in here. It's a, it's a, I really think it's a myth. The thing we commonly say in churches that I don't think is actually true. We say all sin is sin in God's eyes. So therefore, if you, you know, steal a penny off the counter at somebody's house, or if you go out and become a serial killer and murder 50 people, well, it's all sin in God's eyes. I don't think that's actually true. Now, let me tell you, this comes from a true concept. The fact is, the Bible doesn't deny that some sins are worse than others. Okay, It doesn't deny that some sins are worse than others. It comes from a true concept, and the true concept is this. Any one sin is capable of separating us from God capable of making us impure in his sight. And so all sins are equal in that sense, that any of them can accomplish the deed of pulling us away from God. But it's also true that some sins require more intentionality. Some are more damaging or controlling. In fact, in the, in the Bible, we see that there are different punishments for different sins. One sin may require you just pay back what was lost. Another sin may require that you be put to death yourself. There's a wide range of the, because different sins have different levels of how damaging they are and different levels of, of how hard they make it for us to come back to God. Um, also, notice that when people say this, sin is all sin is sin in God's eyes. I've noticed it's almost always used to soften the blow and not paint it as worse. Like you do something wrong to say, well, sin is sin in God's eyes. So it's the same as if you just sat down and overate at a meal. No one says, well, sin is sin in God's eyes, so it's like you just murdered a person. No one ever uses it to make it seem worse. It's always used almost to make it a seem more palatable. Um, so I don't think that that's actually true. That's a common Christian myth that I don't think is actually the case. Okay, questions so far? Anything? All right, myth number eight. This is the end of the debate. Christians will have to adopt to the way things are now. You ever hear that? Well, we better just handle it the way it is now and adapt to this, and that'll be it. The truth is, and I may have more people disagree with me here, but the truth is, I think the issue is going to be pushed a lot further for Christians. I think the issue is going to be pushed more and pushed farther on Christians. I don't think we're at the plateau yet. Um, I think all the signs of what's going on around us indicate that. There's already been, if you're watching the news, there's already been a lot of court cases against Christians just in their business practices. Uh, Bakers, florists, wedding chapels have been sued, have been fined insane amounts of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, ordered by courts to pay. In Decatur, Tennessee, Decatur County, Tennessee, the entire county clerk's office, which is only three people, but the entire office resigned because they did not want to issue uh, wedding certificates, marriage certificates to same-sex couples. What I find really interesting is the people who are so, the the activists for same-sex marriage, the whole time they were pushing it, they always said, this will not hurt you, this will not affect you in any way, it's not, you can practice your religion however you want, this will have zero effect Now they're saying, well, it will have zero effect unless you own a business or you want to work in government. Then it's going to affect you. So it's always pushing a little bit further. That seems to be the pattern developing. Americans United for Separation of Church and State. That's an organization. Americans United for Separation of Church and State. They are currently pushing legislation, which they have, I think, inappropriately called the Love Thy Neighbor Act. It would prevent businesses and government organizations from refusing to, from refusing, um, a homosexual family or homosexual couple on the grounds of religious freedom. Barry Lynn, who is executive director of the group, did say this about Christian colleges. He said it is on the edge of indefensible for Christian colleges to receive government aid and yet not offer married housing for same-sex couples. That tells you what they're planning next. They're going to go after Christian colleges. He just told you right there. In fact, there's already a lawsuit in the U.K. over churches performing these weddings. Let me just read you a clip from... An article I read, it's from the Libertarian Republic, is the one who wrote this article that reported on this. A wealthy gay couple has decided to launch a lawsuit to force their church to perform their wedding. The Druitt Barlows, a millionaire couple from the UK, stated, we've launched a challenge to the government's decision to allow some religious groups to opt out of marrying same-sex couples. uh, Both attend St. John Baptist Church, a branch of the Church of England, and have been in civil partnership since 2006. Barry Drew Barlow said that he and his partner Tony feel we have the right as parishioners in our village to utilize the church we attend to get married. In other words, what he's saying is, because the church is in our community here, because we have some connection to it, we have the right to tell them what they have to do, and we're going to get the government to make them do that. Now, that's kind of dangerous, because that's no longer churches 
acting freely and making your own decisions. It's the government telling churches, you must submit in this area, this area, this area, if their lawsuit goes through. But I really think this is the direction we're going in, even in America. So, you know, be prepared for the worst. It's not, it may not get that bad yet. I don't know, but be prepared. Any questions? All right, two more to go. Myth number nine. The approval, the approval of homosexuality is the death of Christianity in America. This is another Christian myth. You ever hear this? Hear this? I suppose some non-Christians have this too. People don't so much say this as they act like this at times. The, the truth behind this is um, the church flourishes when it is in stark contrast to society. Um, people kind of tend to think, well, the church is on the decline. It's going to get weaker and weaker till it's gone. Actually, the exact opposite is true. Um, and I've said, I'm sort of afraid younger Christians are going to try to just kind of retreat and say, leave us alone, don't bother us, do what you want, but we don't want to do anything, we just want to stay safe. And I'm afraid older Christians are just going to say, well, good thing I'm going to die soon, so I don't have to deal with this. And that's not the attitude. Um, <laughs> the encouraging thing about the direction of our society is that it is going to spur the church. Okay, It will force us to get serious about our mission because we've been pretty lax in recent years, if I can be critical of the church. Um, you know, historically, the, the church does not do well when Christians are fat and lazy. But when, pre, when there's pressure, when, people, when Christians are told you must submit or when society is just drastically different around them, then that's when the church always soars. It's essentially like we got too fat and then we're either going to work out and turn the fat into muscle meaning the people who are kind of on the edge are either going to get really serious about their faith or when the pressure comes on, we're going to trim the fat off, meaning the people who are on the edge are going to decide it's not worth it and to walk out. Either way, the church gets lean and gets fit and accomplishes some amazing things. Um, example is uh, China right now. If you guys know anything about what's going on in the church in China, the government is trying to control it. They only allow um, certain government ordained churches, which are not very good churches at all, I've been told by a Chinese Christian actually, no. Um, yet the underground church in China is just exploding. The government's trying to control it, but they can't. Christians are growing and active and reaching new people too fast for the government to have any control over it. So don't be discouraged, basically. Christianity does its best when it's under pressure. Okay, one more myth to go through. This is another Christian myth that we need to talk about. Christians should not should not associate with homosexuals. I mean, because they're 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 sinful people. They're kind of dirty people. We don't really want anything to do with them, right? So we should just avoid them and stay away from them. The truth is, Christians have an obligation to help homosexuals, and we can't do that if we're avoiding them like the plague. Uh, understand this. First off. Not all homosexuals hate Christians. That's kind of the, the, the picture that's painted is that they're just all these activists who just want to rip away all of our religious freedom. Some of them do. They don't all want that, though. You know, when Bree was in um, grad school, there was a guy in her class, a guy in her office, who I met a few times, really nice guy named Tom. He was a homosexual. Um, very nice guy, though. Um, and Bree actually told me that during their classes, a lot of times, you know, it was, it was a liberal school's, like, attack on kind of Christianity. A lot of times in class, they sit around and start, you know, criticizing the church. She said when that would happen, actually, Tom was one of the few people who would stand up and defend it, would, would defend Christianity to his peers. Not all homosexuals hate Christians. Understand that. Um, we are here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the suffering world, and that includes homosexuals, and that includes the same-sex advocates. All right? If we push them away, if we react in anger, if we refuse to have anything to do with them until they clean up their act, then we will not reach them, and we will fail in our mission as a church. So then, how do we treat homosexuals? Well, um, don't encourage or approve of their lifestyle. Don't say, well, it's okay, that's you, then you can do what you want. But I'd, I mean, if it comes up, make sure they know where you stand. Make sure they know that you love them and that you care about them, that you want to be their friend. But at the same time, don't, um, don't, don't pretend like it's okay, too. Through intelligent discussions, through friendships, through sharing the love of Christ, they can be reached. All right. Remember, Jesus didn't tell sinners he'd be their friends once they cleaned up their act. He said, you know, come to me. He made friends with them first, and then he brought them into the kingdom of God. 
I will say this. I just want to close with this idea. Then we'll take any last questions. Okay. I spoke to a man the other day who, um, I was some, I'm just circumstances. I'm not going to There was a guy I was talking to the other day, raised Christian, Christian environment, Christian background. I'm afraid he had the wrong idea about all this because we were talking and somehow this topic came up. There was a news TV on or something we were talking and the guy said, well, you know, all those homosexuals are going to figure out that we were right when they're burning in hell. You know what? They may find out then. I would much rather them find out now and go to heaven with us. And that's our mission as a church.